Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again this year. Um, I don't really mind coming over. I know it's regarded as a bit of an effort, but um, I quite like to get across here to WA. We have quite a business here at Canaccord in Western Australia, and I often find it's sort of a different, it's a different environment, um, just because I guess it is uh, the other side of the country from the east. Uh, the weather's always pretty good. I flew in on 31 degrees at lunchtime yesterday in Perth. Uh, the, um, I guess the, the natural resources, the prosperity, it can often feel completely different to not just the East Coast, but the rest of the world. So I think you probably should bear that in mind. It probably still feels pretty good living here, no doubt. Um, but the wider world is, is more complex, and you can probably see that from the news. Um, I know you're going to hear from a whole lot of resource companies over the next two days. So my objective today is just to give you a bit of background on the world environment, because those companies operate in the global economy and face the commodity prices that are there. Uh, it's true that last year I was pretty bullish at this time. It was a bit of a contrarian stance. Uh, it reflected the fact that through the first three quarters of 2022, we'd had a big drop in markets, not just stock markets, but bond markets. And the returns were pretty bad, but we had that behind us. And I think at that point when I was talking, the US stock market, the um, S&P 500 was down almost 30%. And I felt that the sort of risks that we might be facing, which, which were still real because we were still trying to come out of the, the pandemic and back onto a more sustainable position in the world economy, I thought the risks were probably fairly well reflected in the market. And so we tried to tell people to start to move back in. And that was reasonably good judgment. We then had a rally for the, the next six to nine months in stocks. Now, though, that things are a little bit more sanguine, uh, I feel there's probably a little bit of risk of complacency. And while I'm not, I'm not actually super concerned, I still feel it's probably right to be a bit more cautious. Uh, what I would say is that we need to recognise the substantial progress that's been made over the last 18 months in getting the world back to a more sustainable state. Once we get back to that, then there's a lot of upside potential as economic expansion resumes at a solid rate and uh, corporate profitability rises and stock prices as well. And interest rates being back to normal won't be a headwind like they were. Uh, so that's what's out there lying ahead of us potentially within the next 12 months. And we've made a lot of progress to get to that. So I want to talk about that to begin with. But I also want to just re reflect on the risks that still remain. And we've, we've got some of those from the economic environment, but we're also getting them from geopolitical uh, issues at the moment, as you're no doubt well aware. And then I will just conclude about how we would sort of um, position ourselves to, to face that. So um, I think it's still grounds for caution, but not you know uh, being sort of too pessimistic and being mindful, I think, over the next year, there will be some recovery potential in markets again. And I'll try to talk a little bit about commodities, because obviously that's the, the world you're going to be talking about for the next two days. That's the usual disclosure and disclaimer. You're going to have three seconds to read that. I just need to tell you that this is general advice. So if you, for your own personal circumstances, you need to talk with a Canaccord advisor. This is just general perspective on the market. That's the main thing I say there in all those words. So just to, to the progress um, that's being made, uh, usually when you get an environment like the one we've been in with high inflation, not only is it unusual, we have only had it uh, rarely in outside of wartime, but it's also usually very difficult to, to deal with. Um, you know, most uh, seasoned economists would hang their head and think of, the problems that lie ahead when you see the sort of high inflation that the world had early last year. But uh, we've got it, we've, it's, it's come down quite substantially all around the world, including here in Australia. And to the second point, it's happened without, without all that much cost to economic activity. I know people are struggling. We've got a cost of living crisis that inflation's caused, and everyone has that around the world. But Generally, when inflation comes down, it's usually at some substantial cost to the economy. 
And so far, it, it hasn't been all that painful. It's not to say it's not been without its costs, but it could have been a lot worse. So I'll talk about that too. And then the other thing is that interest rates are now much more back to normal. They were down at zero. That was never going to go on forever. For them to come up the way they did was always going to be challenging. In, in capital markets, when interest rates start to rise and the yields on all the asset markets, whether it's stocks, property, bonds, they have to match. They have to come up and match those, uh, those yields. It, the prices have to come down. And we've been through that. So that's, that's another encouraging thing about the situation we're in. So I thought I would just touch on some of these to show you the picture. So inflation is down but not out. Um, if you look at the major economies, uh, the US, the Euro, Euro area, Britain, Australia, I could have put more countries on here, but it just starts to get messy. You can see on the left the headline inflation that gets reported in the papers. It's come down quite a lot. And if you look at the reference period before the pandemic, that's really what people want to get back to. And it's, it's a fair way down. Um, as an example, American inflation peaked a bit over 9%. It's now down under 4%. Now, their target is about 2%. So they're not there yet, but they're not far from it. On the right-hand side, you've got the core inflation rate. A lot of the reason why the headline rates have come down is because of energy and food prices. They're very volatile, um, and uh, the analysts tend to try to take them out to get a grip on what the sort of broader pricing pressures are like. And you can see those core measures have also come down, not as much, but they didn't go up as much. So, and they're back to about the same sort of point as the, uh, the headline inflation. So pretty good progress, but not altogether there yet, which I think is why you just have to keep that in mind and, 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 and consider having a bit of caution still. I'll uh, just give you a little bit more colour on the United States because although sometimes people wonder why you talk about the United States so much, um, we're not the 51st state. Uh, it's partly because they dictate what goes on in capital markets a lot of the time. So if you look at the US inflation, and I've got a bit of granularity or sort of subdivision going on here, and this is over a slightly shorter time frame of about a six-month inflation at an annual rate because some of the inflation improvement is quite recent, just the last six months or so. You, you see quite an encouraging picture as well. You see on the left, the headline inflation's down, the core inflation's down, and then when you break it down into components, the core inflation, the goods prices have completely reversed. And for a while there, they were falling, and they've bounced back up a bit, but they're well down on where they were. And the rents are coming down and the, uh, the rest of services as well. Now, again, you're not all the way back to where things were before the pandemic, but it's pretty strong progress, and that's, that's very encouraging. And what that means is that the next step down shouldn't be a whole lot longer and a whole lot harder. I think that's fair to say. If you look at the impact on economic activity, it, it's, it's been way less than everyone feared. These are what economists call purchasing managers' indices. They're basically... Uh, summary measures that are the result of surveying bus business people across economies. And purchasing managers are regarded as have the best grip within companies on the, um, the pulse of the corporate conditions and, and ultimately from aggregating their responses you get a sense of um, economic activity. And the track record of these measures is quite good at, 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 at sort of correlating with the proper official measures like GDP. And, but they come out more often. They come out monthly and they come out quickly. So we have these numbers up to September already. And uh, you can see uh, the way they're, the way they're uh, calculated, they, they try to, uh, what they call, normalise them to a, a value of 50 if things are about normal. And so what you can see here is that whether you break the world into manufacturing and services, and, and for, for materials and commodities, it's the manufacturing side that's key. Uh, or you just look at the whole world altogether, uh, it's, it's actually, it's obviously cooled down over the last, say from 2021, it's cooled down a lot, but only to about, about normal, maybe a fraction below normal. And uh, compared to what happened in the pandemic, it's nothing really. And typically getting inflation down, you tend to have to go below normal for a bit, because you have to, you have to create some slack so that the pricing pressures uh, abate. 
So, so we can see that that's, that's very encouraging. I think. And then if we look at it by region, you also see something quite similar, which is that pretty much all the regions are not doing too badly. Europe's a bit worse than everywhere else, but Europe's got a war on its eastern border, which they haven't had since the Second World War. And as a consequence of that, they had crazy energy prices, gas prices. And yet even with that, the, uh, the pulse of the European economy is not too bad. And the US economy is still reasonably healthy. And the other one that's often worried about is China. And obviously, in the resource space, that's pretty key. And they've struggled coming out of the pandemic for a variety of reasons. But even the economy in China is not too dire. And provided they keep incrementally offering support to economic activity, it should also still be OK. So um, that's, that's actually, most people would say that's quite remarkable. And some of the, you know, the world's leaders, like the Federal Reserve Chairman, you know, some of the famous American economists do think it's all pretty remarkable. So there is a, to be honest, there's a fair bit to be thankful for. I mean, you might say, we got the pandemic, that wasn't something to be that thankful for, and the inflation is really an aftermath, but still, it's good to, to sort of think we're getting through it not too badly. Um, for commodities, it's, it's actually been helpful as well, because the thing I find is the most important, ultimately, for commodity prices is industrial activity. You know, that's basically the source of demand for materials, whether it be base metals, bulk commodities, um, energy. Obviously, secular stories like, you know, the energy transition are going to drive long run prices in some areas, but the cycle in commodity prices is very tied to global industrial production. You can see for yourself, this is the record going back a few decades. And the fact that the industrial production growth, which is read here on the right-hand scale, is still modestly positive, is, is helpful. It's actually a little bit below the normal trend. The trend is about 2 to 3%. And that's approximately what commodity supply grows by in the, in the sort of world, world economy. If you think of the really big pervasive commodities like copper, the supply of copper tends to grow a couple of percent a year. So if the industrial demand is growing at the same, you tend to get relatively stable prices. The fact that the industrial demand is slightly sub that is the reason the prices have corrected. So the commodity prices here, this is a really broad measure. It includes agriculture, energy and metals. It's from the International Monetary Fund. And it's kind of down about 12% over 12 months. Now, It'll be different in all different commodities. This is just the aggregate picture. But again, that could have been a lot worse given the fight against inflation. So I think these are all the positives. And given we've gotten so far in getting inflation back to where it needs to be without too much cost, even if there is a bit more cost to come, which I'm a bit inclined to think we will see some ultimately, uh, it's probably not going to be too precipitous, and even if it were to be, because you can never rule some of these deeper risks out, there'd be ample room to reverse the policy tightness immediately, because they're pretty much largely on top of inflation already. So although I'm going to be sort of concluding cautiously, I think this needs to be recorded, that, that, that a lot of has been achieved. It's been a really frustrating couple of years. I started at Ken Accord two years ago, and the first thing I had to say, and it's pretty much all I've said since has been pretty much to be cautious. Although, as I said, for a stretch there, we got a bit more relaxed because of the market adjustment. Um, and it has been extremely frustrating. It feels like a bit of a marking time phase. But mindful of this progress, we'll be coming out of this at some point, potentially in the next 12 months. So not to let you off the hook too easily, I just talk about some of the remaining risks here. They're pretty straightforward. Inflation's not yet back to where it needs to be, so that remains. Uh, we have these geopolitical tensions, which I'll touch on. And then the financial markets, unlike this time last year, where the US stock market was down nearly 30%, it's almost back to its prior peak. So the, the easiest thing for me in making judgments about moving in and out of markets is, what's the price? I like going shopping when things are cheap. Uh, at, and that was the case last year. 
but things have rebounded a lot. So with the risks around still, I'm a bit more inclined to think they could drop again. And that's, that's you know, this, this sense that markets are a bit sanguine. So where, where do we see these sort of, um, these risks? One manifestation is a lot of volatility. Uh, I'll just explain this one. But what we've got in the top part of the chart is the volatility in the bond market. Um, I remember there was a US political advisor said that when he died he wanted to come back as the bond market because everybody's scared of the bond market. And you may not invest in the bond market, but it tends to drive a lot of the other markets. And uh, what, what I've got here is, looks complex, but it's a simple thing. It's the change in the bond rate, the 10 year rate, which is like the benchmark, every day. It's the average over a month of the daily change. And it's measured in basis points. So one basis point is one hundredth of a percent. And so if you read across the chart, it's been sitting above five for about two years. It's, it's elevated volatility. And what that means is that the bond yield, which at the moment I think in the United States is about 4.8%, it's going up by about 7, 0.07 on average per day, which is, which is relatively high because it usually goes up by like 0.2 or 0.3 in normal times. And that's a signal of a few things, but what it's telling you at the moment, because it's been very elevated just right at the last month or so, is that the, the totality of all those investors don't know where interest rates are gonna ultimately settle still. So one day they think they're gonna be higher, the next day they think they're gonna be lower, it's, it's jumping around a lot. And that's because we still haven't seen inflation come all the way back to where it was, and, and yet the economic activity hasn't slowed all too sharply either. In some respects, it's a bit ironic. If the world economy was a bit weaker, the bond market would be more relaxed because it would feel they can see enough signs that the problem's under control ultimately, even if it means a bit of economic pain. So because it's not totally clear cut yet, the bond market's jumping all over the place, not knowing where things go. Now, the stock market, which is the S&P 500, this is the percentage change every day. It's averaging only about 0.2 or 0.3. It's still pretty benign. But there's a risk at some point that one flows into the other if we continue to see these sorts of um, this sort of uncertainty manifesting. Um, and you know the, the the big worry in the background here, apart from the geopolitical risks, is that we've had the most aggressive rise in interest rates in in decades, and certainly the broadest probably ever. So what what this picture is is basically uh, it's the the percent of countries raising their interest rates each month in blue and the percent lowering them. And the sample at the moment's got about 36 central banks in it, including the European Central Bank, which covers 19 countries. So you can see that over the last year, we've never had a time when so many central banks raise interest rates all at once. And obviously everyone's interdependent and the risk was that they weren't looking over their shoulders enough at what they were each doing, um, and the consequences could reverberate. And we've seen interest rates go from about zero to five in a lot of economies. Ours have only gone from zero to four, but pretty much in most of the other Anglo-speaking economies, they've gone another percent or so more. And history shows that that generally slows things down pretty sharply. And so everyone's a bit wary about this. We haven't seen it yet, but so this, this risk is out there still. And I think it's probably it's, it's worth being wary about it. We do see some signs of its consequences, but they're not really across the board yet. So uh, we need, need to keep that in mind. When the inflation is back to the targets, they can ease this up. They can take the pressure off. So then we won't have to worry so much. But in the interim, we still have to be a bit mindful. One of the things that's causing a complication is that in America especially, but also in Europe and even here to some extent, governments are continuing to spend quite a lot. So as the monetary policy has been made restrictive, the fiscal policies remain very expansionary. And I'll just illustrate it with the situation in the United States because it is the most dramatic. And the point here is you've got the budget, the federal budget of the United States government in this sort of green type colour as a percent of the GDP. The other series is the unemployment rate, which is on the right and it's upside down. 
So when that blue line is high, the unemployment rate's very low. And you know from Australia, when you're in a recession, when there's a lot of unemployment, the budget gets worse because people have to get support. And uh, we saw that in the pandemic in, in all countries, including America, that spike in, in um, unemployment and the budget went down. Now, if you look at the history, usually when the unemployment rate is as low as it is at the moment, the American budget is fairly close to balance. In fact, in, under Bill Clinton in the late 90s, when the unemployment rate was not far from where it is today, at, at just under 4%, the American budget was in surplus, the first time in the post-war, I think, or thereabouts. And likewise, back in the early and mid-60s, virtually a budget balance, very strong economy. The irony at the moment is that there's an extremely strong economy still. Unemployment's about 3.7%. Actually, apart from in the pandemic and in the financial crisis, this is the biggest budget deficit they've ever had. And it's actually going to... Pro it's projected to go on for another five or seven years. So it's a sort of indication that the, the stimulatory expansion, which was really big in COVID, has kept up. And it's making it hard to slow the economy down because while the central bank's raising rates to restrict things, the government's spending and spending to grow things. And the main, manifest, the main sort of forms this is taking at the moment is underpinning the energy transition there. Vehicles, uh, the grid, you know, uh, modernising the electricity grid. Uh, they're also subsidising companies to onshore a lot of their uh, industry capacity to, to, to remove some of the geopolitical risks. And this is driving investment and it's keeping the economy going, driving jobs. So it's kind of a little, it's a little bit uh, at odds with what they're trying to do in, in lower inflation. And it's making it hard to judge ultimately the path we're on. So some economists think we're on a, we're heading for a soft landing. Some economists think there's gonna be a hard landing and other economists think there's gonna be no landing. No landing where they, the plane just keeps flying, but the inflation could stay higher than they want. And that's the sort of experience they've had in the past with inflation. No one likes to get it down and often they let it stay around because it's a bit too hard to get it all the way down. Uh, I think if we get the no landing, eventually we'll get the hard landing. But we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But I think the uncertainty there is, is grounds for just being cautious a bit longer. One minute. My God. Uh, look, I won't say a lot about the Middle East, but... Obviously, the risk to oil prices, because there's a lot of oil producers in the Middle East, if sanctions are ramped up because the war broadens, it's not an ideal time. This is a really busy, busy picture, but the main takeaway is that higher oil prices, although they affect the headline inflation, they also affect the underlying inflation because oil is such a perv pervasive input. Right, now, I just wanted to just lastly finish off with the sanguineness of markets. Uh, most people are still talking about a soft landing rather than a hard landing. I wouldn't take a whole lot of comfort from that because that was the case before the financial crisis in 2006 and also before the, the dot-com recession, the internet recession at the start of the 2000s. So it could be a, a false hope. Uh, and it, finally, if you look at the US stock market, um, this correction that we've been going through over the past 18 months, it's from peak to peak, it's pretty little, pretty tiny. Look at what happened in 2008, look what happened in 2001, and two, so uh, and the and the corporate earnings are projected to be pretty resilient. So that you have that risk, and the other risk you have is um, even given the earnings, the market um, still has to cope with offering higher yields. The stock market has got to compete with the bond market and all the other potential yields in the market. And as the market in bond, the yields have gone up a lot. The uh, the stock yields haven't really adjusted much yet. So what we could well see is higher stock yields, which would lower the price earnings multiples, and that could also create a bit of downside. So, progress on inflation, but not back to targets, and you do have these geopolitical risks. If they really flare up, you could get quite a correction. If oil prices jump over $100, stock prices drop, that could be an opportunity that we just don't have at the moment because everything is so sanguine. And so that, ironically, although it's such a humanitarian tragedy, you could free up the markets a bit than what they've been. Well, I'm getting scared now, I better wind up. <laughs> That's it. I'm happy to take any questions, but we probably don't have time.